Hello, I need to talk to you really quickly about how computers store numbers. Computers use binary, zeros and ones, we all know this. Take any number, convert it to binary, that's what a computer sees. This is a fantastic way to store basically any whole number, but what about, like, 1.5. How do we represent a decimal when all we have to work with are zeros and ones? The answer is scientific notation. Remember this? Turns out that it's really useful in computer science. And the concept really isn't even very complicated. When written in scientific notation, a number has three important components. The significant is this part to the left, which is just a normal number. There is one important constraint we need to keep in mind here. With scientific notation, there's always just one digit to the left of the decimal point. There's several reasons for this, none of which are super important right now, but this constraint is actually the very thing that will let us trick a computer into storing a fraction, so it's worth keeping in mind. There's always exactly one digit then the decimal point. Now in a normal number, the size of the number is determined by the position of the decimal point. Take the digits 1, 2, 3, and 4. If we put a dot here, we get 1.234, a pretty small number. If we slide the dot over, we get a much larger number from the exact same digits. But with scientific notation, we can't move the decimal point. The significant always has to begin with one digit followed by a decimal point. So the size of whatever number we're storing has to be determined not by the position of the decimal point, but by the second important component, this exponent up here. If we take 1.234 and we multiply it by 10 to the power of 2, we end up with 123.4. This is numerically identical to just moving the decimal point over by 2, but it's being done with math, the same math that computers are extraordinarily good at. That being said, we are still firmly in human territory here because all of these numbers are still in base 10. This is where our third important component comes into play, this 10 here. This is called the base. It's called the base because it's referring to the exact same concept as it does in, say, base 10 or base 2. Scientific notation is most commonly seen as some significant times 10, but that's only because we like working in base 10. There's nothing stopping us from writing a base 2 number in scientific notation. We just end up with something like this. Behold! A float! Well, okay, if we're being pedantic, this is not actually a float. The computer still just gets a string of zeros and ones. But the point is that those zeros and ones can be split into one whole number representing the decimal part of the significant, and another whole number representing the exponent. So by exploiting scientific notation, we can trick a computer into storing decimals, even though it only ever sees whole numbers. This is extraordinary narrowly useful for a wide range of computational problems, but more importantly, it lets us make video games. Take, for example, an object in a three-dimensional game world. The object's position is defined by three numbers, x, y, and z. If we were limited to just integers, then everything would be locked onto a rigid grid, and this wouldn't just be a problem for developers designing levels, either. Players would also have to contend with their every movement snap to the grid. But, of course, we're not limited to just integers. We have floats. And floats are capable of storing all of the important nuance between whole numbers. So designers are free to make more naturalistic scenes, and players can move around in them smoothly. There is... One little quirk, though. Floats are fantastic for two things, storing extremely large numbers and storing extremely precise numbers. Unfortunately, floats are not great at storing extremely large precise numbers. There are only so many zeros and ones available to store the significant. That information can store an extremely large whole number, 
or an extremely precise decimal, but it can't do both at the same time. Now, for the vast, vast majority of video games, this is not a problem. If your player's position is being described in the millions, chances are pretty good that something has gone wrong. Floats are perfectly capable of simulating an extremely large game world, significantly larger than anything a team of designers could create by hand. In order for floating point precision errors to become a problem, you would need to somehow have an infinite game world. In 2010, Minecraft released an update which featured a system to generate infinite game worlds. So what happens if, in Minecraft, you just pick a direction and keep walking? How does Minecraft respond to its terrain generation being pushed to its outer limits? Well, not a whole lot happens. Not for a while, at least. Floats are limited, but they can still store a lot of information. Minecraft can generate hundreds of square kilometers of terrain with absolutely no issue. If you're persistent, though, the first thing you'll notice is that everything starts to get jittery. This hopefully makes some intuitive sense. The player's position is being stored using floats, so what we're witnessing here is those float values getting large enough to lose precision. But if you keep pushing through the jitter and manage to get over 12 million blocks away from where you started, a 12,000 kilometer journey, something remarkable happens. This is The Farlands, one of the strangest glitches in video game history. Why does this happen? Honestly, I don't know. I don't think I want to know. There's something about this alien terrain that feels like explaining it would diminish it. It's strangely cosmic, way out there, thousands of kilometers away from civilization, the math that underpins this world suddenly gives way to something else. Kurt J. Mack is a YouTuber and Twitch streamer. In episode 11 of what was otherwise a pretty standard Minecraft Let's Play, Kurt decided to pack his things and start walking to the Farlands. Then, in episode 12, he kept walking. And walking, and walking, and walking, and walking for 50 episodes, then 100 episodes, then 200, then 500 for 14 years. This man has dedicated himself to documenting every step of his journey to this weird, mythical place. There's something bone-chilling about how casually he begins a process that will take him well over a decade of real, actual time. Try to reach what Notch has referred to as the Far Lands, where once you get far enough away from your spawn point, the world starts to bug out and create all kinds of weird features and things like that. It seems pretty interesting. There are only a handful of people in the world who possess the absurd dedication it takes to travel to the Far Lands. I know that because there are only a handful of people in the world who have actually done it. Still, even among this small group, Kurt is special. Very early in Far Lands or Bust, he started raising money for charity. And much like he simply never stopped walking, he never stopped raising money. Block by block, dollar by dollar, Kurt J. Mack and his audience have turned a silly Minecraft walking challenge into over $460,000 for various charities. And thus, we need to address the title of this video. Something remarkable is about to occur. Because on October 4th of this year, five days after this video, Video gets posted, and over 5,000 days after he embarked on his expedition, 
Kurt J. Mack will finally reach the Far Lands. He's gonna make it. Look, I don't know if I've gone too niche with this one, but I swear to God, for a very specific corner of the internet, this is almost like witnessing the moon landing. I remember years ago ruminating about how someday I would get to witness Kurt J. Mack reach the Far Lands, and now that day is rapidly approaching. I don't really do calls to action on this channel, but I will break that rule to say Kurt live streams his journey on Twitch so you have an opportunity to witness this happen live. He's scheduled to reach the Farlands on October 4th. I'll leave a link to his Twitch channel below. And on the off chance that Kurt himself sees this video, I just want to say congratulations. You've done something that is worth celebrating, and you've done it in a way that is itself worth celebrating. And for the rest of you, thank you for watching. Mark your calendars October 4th on Kurt J. Max Twitch channel. I will We'll see you there.